Okay, so finish the recording now? Yeah. Cool. Um, okay, so do you want to do the introduction? Yeah, okay, so this is going to be um, our first web, um, webinar series called the Syn Bio Speaker Series, where we bring in a new researcher in syn synthetic biology to come talk about their work or broadly about the syn field of synthetic biology. It's hosted by Stanford iGEM and Stanford Biome jointly. This week we have Professor Drew Endy speaking, who is also Stanford iGEM's mentor. So, Drew, you can go ahead. Thanks so much, Sarah and, and Jordan. Thanks for having me and uh, great to be here with everybody. Um, I think what we decided is I'd offer some remarks for 10 minutes or so, and then we'd go into free and frank conversation and discussion. You still want to do that? Yeah, it sounds good. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen if that's okay, and um, we'll take it from there. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, I really want to emphasize my, my hope is that um, uh, we get to a free and frank discussion uh, right from the beginning, uh, and, uh, from whatever prompts you want to take from my comments. By, by free and frank, it, it's um, sort of a term from the diplomatic uh, world where it's the conversations diplomats have unofficially, you know, mm -hmm. so you're just, you're talking about how it really is. That's what I mean. Okay. Um, I'm unsure if everybody is familiar with synthetic biology. And so I wanted to start with the synthetic part uh, underneath synthetic biology, if you will, when you lift the lid on that domain. And what I'm introducing here is a technology um, most widely known as DNA synthesis. DNA synthesis, you could think of it like a synthesizer, but not a musical synthesizer that makes music, rather a synthesizer that makes DNA, that makes genetic material. Of course, if you had a musical keyboard, you'd have 88 keys and music would come out. In this case, the keyboard has four keys, one for each base of DNA, A, T, C, and G. And depending on how you press those four keys on a keyboard, the chemicals that can be organized to make DNA from scratch will be played out in plumbing to stitch together a polymer of material, which is the genetic material, the nucleic acid. And whatever sequence you play on that keyboard the synthesizer will compose the molecule instantiating that specific nucleic acid. I'm hopelessly biased, uh, but I'm going to declare that the uh, DNA printer is the most important technology of the 21st century. And the reason I'll back that claim up any day you want is because it allows, it's the printing press for life. It allows you to go from human ideas, human intention, to the extent you can encode those into genetic material, well, you get to do that and instantiate the genetic material from scratch. So it's a printing press, but a printing press of the 21st century, not onto paper, but into life. It's still very early, still very primitive, but it, but it exists. Um, what can you do with this printing press? Here's an example from not that long ago, um, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, back in the innocent early days of December and January. So um, what was happening back then is there was an infection, um, uh, samples were isolated. In China, uh, researchers there from those isolates read out the genome using another tool, DNA sequencing, and posted that sequence information online on the 10th of January of 2020. As soon as that sequence information was available online, that means anybody with access to the internet can get those uh, letters, those A's, T's, C's, and G's, that if you play them in the right order, you get back the genome, the genetic instructions for the COVID-19 uh, virus. And so if you look at this plot down on the bottom, you can see the genome sequence released 10 January out of Shanghai, if I remember correctly. And this group here in Germany, if I remember correctly, maybe it's in Switzerland, but in Europe, let's say, four days later, they're ordering DNA to remake the genome of uh, COVID-19. And then if you play the, the tape out, it takes them from January 1-4 to February 4, so call that three weeks, for that DNA to come back from the commercial DNA foundries. And within a week, 
of them getting the DNA back, they've assembled that into full length um, fragments of virus genomes. And by the 12th of February, they've remade from scratch in their laboratories um, the, the COVID-19 virus. So it took less than a month, in other words, for um, physical material to be turned into information. This is the physical material of the viral genome. Then it's the computer database information of the genome and the bits, and those go over the internet, and then you remake from bits to atoms the virus. Um, this is being done for research purposes, but basically what this indicates is biology and biotechnology can move around as it normally does physically, but it also can move around to the extent you can read it and write it back by, it can move around as information over the internet. What else can you do with the DNA printers? I just wanna give you a totally different example. In this case, there's a 3D printed bunny rabbit, but it's a little bit different from your typical 3D printer. The polymer used in the 3D printer actually has embedded in it microscopic glass particles, and inside those glass particles is newly synthesized DNA. In this case, you might ask, well, what is that DNA encoding? It's quite interesting. It's encoding the computer file that instructs the 3D printer how to make this specific object the bunny rabbit. And so this 3D printed bunny rabbit, which is not alive, it's just a, a plastic object, has inside it the DNA instructions for printing 3D printed bunny rabbits. And what these researchers showed is that you can actually recover that DNA, sequence it, turn that into a computer file, remake the rabbit, go through multiple rounds of replication. So imagine if any object you have, doesn't have to be alive, has inside it the instructions for making the object. Or if you're following along and you abstract this result, you can put arbitrary information in arbitrary objects. And so my favorite example would be, imagine if the handle for your refrigerator door had the DNA inside it encoding information for rebuilding civilization. Um, the DNA here in this case is not a living molecule. It's an abiotic data storage tape. It's a polymer for storing arbitrary abiotic information. Okay. Um, huh. So let me give you a complicated slide to, to try and offer a frame of reference for thinking about why this matters. And I've given you these two examples, so hopefully you can build from the specific examples into the abstract. What I'm trying to communicate on this slide has to do with, with politics and power, um, the ways we relate to each other and force things to be in certain ways or not. So biology exists in nature, and that's what's shown on the top, what I have in this green box, natural lineages, all of biodiversity, all of the things conservation biology cares about. Um, so there's a politics of that. There's a reality of that. One generation makes the next generation in nature and so on, unless something goes extinct. Um, now, if we look at box two, where it says screen and breed, we're familiar with that. That's what it's like when you go to the state fair and somebody brings their prized pig, right? Or the flower show, and you've got different varietals of, of flowers. This is where you look at an individual and its traits and you decide whether or not to breed it or cross it on the basis of what you see, because we value certain traits over others. And so we're, we're inserting human intention into the sculpting of a lineage. And I, I note that you can sequence the organisms. You don't just have to look at their morphological phenotypes. You can look at all their characteristics, including their DNA when you do this. So that has a type of relationship in politics. You know, it could be a seed saver catalog um, and, and so on. Then there's realm three. Uh, this is editing where we, oh, by the way, realm two is already playing out for humans. So for example, if you have uh, a pregnancy as a woman, you can have your blood drawn and there'll be DNA from the fetus in your blood circulating and you can read that out to learn, will it be a boy or a girl um, forming inside? Um, what else can we learn about the genetics of the fetus? And on the basis of that information, humans are now uh, making decisions about whether or not to bring that pregnancy to term. So, you can imagine there's politics there, right? There's power relationships there. The editing uh, is genetic engineering. Uh, it has touched upon the human, but of course it's most practiced with plants and animals. 
also with controversy. I would guess everybody here is familiar with labeling around genetically modified this and that uh, in the food supply. Then we come to the fourth regime, and this is what I was hinting at. This is what I call the synthetic regime, and it's mostly um, in the future. It doesn't exist, except for the few examples I was giving. This is where you can take the reading and writing of DNA and move biology around over the network. And that's only really been shown for a few things like viruses um, and if maybe a microbial genome if you're, if you're, if you're permissive with me. Um, but that's a big deal because before that became at all imaginable, biology could only promulgate through space-time if there was this physical process of direct descent from one generation to the next. So this idea that we're moving biology around over the network is incredibly interesting. Um, the other thing which is very strange to think about is, well, you note there's this gap on the bottom where this lineage is going along and it stops and then it picks back up. This means if we can make life from information and raw materials, we can make life without constraint to the lineages that came before. And, and maybe we can touch upon that in conversation. But those are, in my limited opinion, the new things about what 21st century bioengineering and synthetic biology shows up with. It's this fourth regime for which the politics remain unexplored and therefore up for grabs. By the way, this, this deck is not um, uh, a comprehensive historical on-ramp into synthetic biology. Rather, it's just the opposite. It's the postcards of the things that are most incredibly exciting to me in the moment uh, to get you quickly uh, tastes of what the front lines are. This doesn't look like it has anything to do with biology initially, um, but it's literally one of the most exciting things I've come across in the last year. So it turns out you can take electricity that can be generated however you like, for example, photo, photovoltaic solar panel. And if you work with chemists and chemical engineers, they can take that electricity and split water. And if you provide carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, they'll take that carbon molecule and turn it into a simple organic molecule such as formate. More recently, and so that's been done for over a decade roughly, much more recently in the last year, genetic engineers have been able to take, inspired by natural organisms, uh, the tools of genetic engineering, apply them to microbes and remake microbes so that they grow on formate as say, opposed to sugar. And if you put these two postcards together, which is what I've married on the slide, you can say, well, how much biomass could I make starting with a kilowatt hour of electricity? And the answer is it looks like about a gram. People aren't doing this routinely, but it's seeming like this is not possible. And if you talk to the chemists and chemical engineers, they think they can get the yields up such that one kilowatt hour of electricity gets you 30 grams of biomass. Um, when you think about that, if it's hard to think about what that means, if you think, think about the, if you have to take a course of antibiotics and how many milligrams of antibiotics you're taking. So a gram of biomass might be a treatment of antibiotics for an infection. 11 cents of electricity gets you medicine. Um, wherever you have the electricity and wherever you have carbon in the atmosphere, which is everywhere. So this then implies something which doesn't exist, but I can foresee and I'm very excited about. It's, uh, we're all familiar with the PC, the personal computer. What if we could make PBs, the personal biosynthesizer? It's a box. It takes as input power, electricity, internet, which is sequence code, biocode and air, which is bringing nitrogen and carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and water. Um, we're going to have to do something around phosphorus and other trace elements. But what comes out of this box is whatever biology can do. Um, and if you're thinking about, right about this, I, I think the way to think about this is we've got the PB ahead of us. And we also have this internet enabled biotech, which I'll just shorten to Bionet. And I think the ramifications of that are instead of designing California made in China, it's design the DNA code wherever you can do that work and grow the biology wherever you can operate this process, the, wherever you can get electricity, basically, and internet. Um, so that's interesting to think about. And then it begs some questions, like how's that world gonna work? And this is a photo outdated from iGEM, not too outdated, but uh, a couple years ago. Um, I wonder about why iGEM's so tiny like, why is it only 6,000 people a year? Um, and of course, the immediate answer is because it's so expensive. Um, I'm not sure that's the right answer. It's a valid answer, but I'm not sure it's the right answer. 
but I'm thinking about this community being a thousand times bigger, practically. Uh, because if it was a thousand times bigger, then that would be about one in a hundred people on earth um, when you integrate over a human lifespan. And that seems like the right minimum literacy rate for biotech when I, when I ponder that. Um, why, do I, why do I say that? Because I, I think about how um, biology interacts with culture and civilization. And I want to sort of pivot and close my opening remarks with some reflections on culture. Um, everybody may know of or should know of Martin Luther King. He gave an incredibly famous speech on civil rights in Washington, D.C. decades ago. And maybe you've heard of this speech. It was called, I Have a Plan. And if you just, oh, no, that's not right, it turns out. That's not what his speech is called. His speech was called, I have a dream. And that's interesting. Um, and it's important. Because when you think about what your dreams are, that gives you a chance of organizing people to work together. Um, and I'm gonna skip over this slide because I don't think it's the most important thing to talk about. And I'm gonna go right into some more comments about dreams. So what do I mean by this? And this will come back to biology and, and bioengineering and synthetic biology. We all know that there are different types of dreams. You could have a nightmare or you could have a dream about something being awesome. And I wanna reflect on this because it matters when we think about what becomes of bioengineering and how we make bioengineering true or not, at least as I see it develop. If you put forward a negative dream and you want people to react to that, it requires that the bad thing starts to come true before people will react. So when we think about the narrative, the story that's being told around climate change, it's nightmarish. Um, it's really frightening. It's, it is what it is, but the, the story we're telling about it is a nightmarian dream. Um, and what that means is inevitably, before people will be motivated to react, the dream has to become ever more true, ever worse. And maybe eventually more and more people will react. I'm not sure this is the right labeling, but it's a fine example. What would be the opposite? We'll just say, well, let's, let's talk about climate awesome. What climate do we wish for? And if you start to get people to dream about the positive outcome that could be realized, then people might start working on it before it happens to make it come true because they want it, as opposed to something they fear that they don't want, but they won't really act until it starts to, so, so we also do have experience with positive dreams practically, right? Think about the narrative of the Apollo program in the United States going to the moon. We're yearning for the stars. And that was sufficient to organize people in advance of getting to the moon, uh, if you see what I mean. So what dream might we share regarding biology? And on the left side of this slide, I'm just um, highlighting some recent federal government actions in the United States. One is the Endless Frontiers Act, which is um, saying basically we need to invest more in science, including bioengineering, biotechnology. The other is an event um, helped with back at the White House in October on the bioeconomy, the American bioeconomy. And when you look at these types of um, mechanisms, it's not obvious what the dream is. And so I wanna give you an example of what that would be that could be very, very explicit. This is not a prescription, it's just an example. And this is where I think there needs to be tremendous debate, not just by the bioengineers, but by everybody. So when, when I dream positively about bioengineering, things that show up in my mind are a civilization that can provision for 10 billion people, no problem because biology is operating on a planetary scale and organizing atoms, the stuff we need on that scale, well beyond what humanity needs. Without a doubt, the physics suggests we should be able to provision for 10 billion people. And then the second part is, and we can do that without trashing the place, without having things go extinct, um, without overriding nature entirely. Um, I have another part of my dream. I'd like to make infectious disease obsolete why is it okay in epidemiology to have a strategy which is wait for the pandemic to happen and then react? There's no strategic domain where any leader would say, ah, the right strategy is to wait and get better at reacting. 
yet for my entire professional career, 20 years now, um, not just in the United States, everywhere, epidemiology apparently takes a strategic posture of let's wait for the pandemic, please. It's insane. It's like crazy. We should instead dream about making infectious diseases obsolete. When I think about the culture enabled via these tools, the 21st century biotech, I'd like to have a culture that's grounded in citizenship as opposed to having mere standing as only consumers or subjects or objects in relation to transactions. And then there's this fundamental prize of, oh, I actually understand life well enough to appreciate it more. So I think I'll pause there. That's my initial offering. And I'll come off the microphone setup. So now we have more symmetry. Um, okay, this, well, first of all, that was awesome. Um, I, I saw some version of those slides in the past and it still blew my mind this time. Um, I want to start with a question about understanding life because I feel like we're at a point in history where um, there are multiple pathways we're taking that are going to really like put an existential question in front of our face and that we're creating life through synthetic biology um, with the ability to, within 10 years, build the first cells from the ground up, but also we're creating arguably life through artificial intelligence. Um, so we have this dual story of like, a, like minerals and rocks coming to life, just like we have these organic materials coming to life. We're really gonna have to grapple with this new understanding and these new things that I guess we have to live with. I mean, what do you think about that? I think you've, Jordan, uh, identified a really important puzzle that has not been resolved. Um, the thing I would acknowledge um, uh, that I find interesting is, um, in the West, um, in the European tradition, there is a frame of reference that was established in the 17th century. Um, there were some products that shipped in the 17th century out of Europe that were very, um, what we would call today, disruptive. And they're still disruptive. Um, one was, um, I think therefore I am, um, Descartes and colleagues. And, and that sets up the following. Everybody is capable of reason and that then leads to the idea of citizenship and democracy in the modern Western form of democracy. There was another uh, product that shipped at the same time, which was approximately um, God is sacred, the angels are sacred, and the mind of man is sacred. Everything else is natural, meaning everything else can be studied and understood. And that idea contributed immensely to call it societal fitness, individual and group fitness, because it allowed for the enlightenment and science as we know it now to get going and proceed. Um, tremendously beneficial as it, as it was, and it still is. However, there are two debts that are now accumulating from this innovation. The first debt is, um, human as a concept. See, this is, this is basically the invention of the human as an idea and then nature as the not the human thing. Um, and I take this from Tobias Reese and other scholars of, of the human. Um, so even people who care about nature always care about the human more than nature on average. And so you want to care about things in the climate and the atmosphere is good luck, right? Because you're swimming uphill, basically. The other thing is it splits all of uh, intellectual life. And you can see this most clearly in universities into the part of intellectual life that studies or thinks about the human, the humanities, and the part of intellectual life that thinks about nature, the natural sciences, and then engineering upon that. Um, that split was operationally beneficial for a long time. It's now very problematic because um, the natural sciences and engineers have gotten to the point where we can actually change what it means to be human. 
and create new human-like things, but we have no idea how to ask or answer the question, what does it mean to be human? That is of the profession of the humanities, but we're operating in this um, split house that was divided four centuries ago. Um, it's very, very hard to connect in a non-trivial way across those divides uh, because they're embedded within all the institutions we're operating within. Um, so, so I know that's a little bit, um, uh, gosh, pretty good for an academic being esoteric. I'll just, uh, what I'm trying to, I'm just acknowledging the goodness of your question. We, we, we have operated in a way that has separated the human from everything else. And we're now in a moment where we can reconnect things and make new things that can be interconnected and related in new ways. And we don't have frameworks for understanding. And we don't have institutions that are architected to support the exploration of that under, like even at Stanford, we have a big initiative in AI, but it's not called the big initiative in AI. And it's not called the, the banana slug centered AI, right? Or the atmosphere carbon centered AI. It's called the human centered AI. Well, why is that? And, and in part, it's because of moves that were laid down in Europe 400 years ago. Uh, that it's that it's about the human, but you're totally right, and and the implications of your question are are very profound and unanswered, at least in what I can see. That's so interesting to think about. Um, There's a nice question in the chat. I don't know if you want to wait for those, or should I pick that one up now? It's from Alan. Oh, um, we were going to wait until like ten more minutes to start answering okay. those, but I had some more uh, questions prepared from the iGem team. Okay. All right. So I guess. Um, yeah, we got we got very philosophical there, um, and I guess tying back to synthetic biology to like quote unquote normal people, what do you think synbio will mean for like regular people in twenty thirty and beyond um, with biosynthesizers and other things like that? I think that's the wrong question. It's the right question, but with the wrong sub-question. Um, what I think synthetic, meaning, meaning um, the, 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 the detailed technical answer to your question and what problems get solved will depend on the form of the technology that gets developed. What will determine the form of the technology that gets developed? That will determine the dreams and wishes of the people who organize resources to have technology get developed in one way or another. So, so um the personal computer is not a technology revolution there's very little innovation in electrical engineering in the personal computer the personal computer was a cultural revolution because it changed who could compute what where for what purpose it complemented previously industrial computing and exclusively industrial computing so the the fundamental impact that synthetic biology offers quote unquote, ordinary people, which by the way is all of us, um, is to help to catalyze a conversation about what does it mean to be a citizen of the 21st century? What do we wish for and demand of each other and our society such that we understand what our relations are to each other and to our, our collective government? The reason synthetic biology contributes to a triggering of that conversation is because biology AKA living matter is literally a uh, physical instantiation of the three primal streams upon which all of life and civilization is built. Energy, knowledge, and stuff. Or to the, the physical, bits and atoms. the jewels, the bits, and the atoms. Like literally biology is the intersection of jewels, bits, and atoms. And it's at the intersection of jewels, bits, and atoms on a planetary scale. And by the way, if you parsed my electrobiosynthesizer thing correctly, what that means is the cap on that is not the natural cap of 90 terawatts of photosynthesis. It's as much electricity as we can make. And if you're tracking what's going on in electricity generation, we're going to an electricity generation abundant civilization. So that cap doesn't seem to be there to me. So um, when's the last time any of us or anybody we know has had a conversation about what it means to be a citizen in a collective way. And so far as I can gather, it's approximately in the US, for example, um, late 1700s, early 1800s. Those conversations are still happening. I don't think they've happened since then. 
And so the most fundamental impact of synthetic biology on people, everybody, is contributing to a triggering of a revisiting of the conversation of what does it mean to be a citizen? There's many other dimensions that are showing up that are at risk of triggering that. Not one of them by itself will probably trigger it, but enough of them colliding would. If you want me to give you like the laundry list of what can biology be used to do, sure, right? I mean, what are the off the shelf examples? Any medicine that's made by biology that's currently sourced by harvesting something from a plant growing somewhere else, that's all gonna be possible to make by brewing, right? So, so you're not gonna get your pain medications from a plantation in Tasmania or Western Australia where the, 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 or Eastern Australia where the wildfires are, right? You'll just have it in a fermenter in Minnesota or wherever you are. Um, that doesn't really change your life experience. It just stabilizes a supply chain for medicines. Um, um, but it would change your life experience if there's a demand shortage because there's a pandemic and you can't get intubated because you can't chill out the nerves in your esophagus because there's no, none of those active pharmaceutical ingredients in the United States. Um, so, so, I mean, there's all of that, um, geez Louise. <laughs> and and that's, the, that's, the, that's the snowflake on the tip of the iceberg. It's just like making stuff. Um, yeah, biology. I mean, it's, the, it's the ultimate distributed technology to make stuff. I mean, yeah. fundamentally, we're um, like, I guess, realizing that ultimate goal. How do you think that's actually going to play out in how governments are structured? If, like, I don't know, if, um, the last 200 years have seen a big shift from, I guess, the idea of citizen to more consumer. Mm -hmm. um, if all of a sudden, we have the ability to make things uh, design anywhere, build everywhere. Like how, how will that, how will that change companies? How might that change like an Amazon or, or a democracy? Yeah. I mean, it's good, right? There's a good question. Uh, two good questions. Um, it's daunting to imagine um, competing with the um, centralized supply chain information management systems and the logistics of say Amazon. Um, and I don't expect bio making um, goes head to head with that. I think it's a complement to that. I think at least initially for sure. Um, meaning for certain things, you just prefer to make them where you are. Uh, for other things, you'd like to get them delivered on your doorstep, made somewhere else. Um, but when I say that, I have to acknowledge that I'm talking about that reality uh, which is only experienced by of order 2 billion people on the planet. And that means the majority of people, about 5 billion people on earth don't experience Amazon or don't experience the internet. Um, and so biology and biotechnology in that context offers quite a lot as a um, basically complementary manufacturing model that doesn't require um, big economic pull ahead of time to get the supply chains in place. I think about the experience of Africa, quote unquote, leapfrogging its communication networks onto the mobile platforms, as opposed to wiring it up, um, uh, just sort of skip that in certain places. So there, there could be in some parts of the world, a skipping or leapfrogging of manufacturing supply where you, you just never build out the centralized supply infrastructure. From a government perspective, I mean, the other part of it was from a government or I don't know if you said government citizenship or democracy perspective. Um, I, I think that I think the start of it is just basically forcing the question. Um, what is my relationship um, uh, uh, to my government? And what is the role of technology in framing that relationship or, or setting the details of that relationship? Um, so so just to give you an example for everybody to, to ponder, um, how many people should be able to read and write? We say everybody. It's a, a primary education is a, is a basic right. Um, how many people should be able to read and write Python or C++ computer code? Um, well, Computer Science for All, that initiative says everybody should have that option. Um, and, and so why is that? It's because having that option of becoming literate is essential for having the option of earning a livelihood, of some satisfaction, of having standing, of, 
of, of not having to be oppressed by others who can do it well as you cannot, then it begs the question, how many people should have the option of learning to read and write DNA? Um, and just another substrate. So why isn't the answer 100% should have that option? And quickly, you get to some prickly questions like, will it be safe? Will it be secure? Will it be ethical? And, you know, those questions actually aren't fundamentally different from questions of safety and ethics with respect to speech. Is it okay to tweet that? It might depend on who you are. Is it okay to put that speech on Facebook? Um, right, so, so um, it's important to note that these issues, when they surface in biology, often aren't particular to biology. They're, they're right. instances of more general issues. But something going viral with uh, the ability to make biology, I mean, could be a lot more dangerous than a viral tweet. You think so? Um, well, I guess that, that's up to debate. Um, but what do you think excites you most like about the future with SynBio? I'm pretty excited about two things. Civilization scale flourishing, 10 billion people in partnership with the planet, because I think that's achievable, not at some arbitrary point in the future. Like a, the napkin math on the physics looks really good right now. And I'm also pretty excited about um, uh, a renewal of, of, of uh, citizen powered democracy. Um, I think that's totally up for grabs and, and, and totally essential for doing the first thing. So at the macroscopic, those are the two things. Um, at the microscopic, I'm very excited about bootstrapping the personal biosynthesizer. I wish for that to come true. Absolutely. Um, I'm also very excited about um, being able to construct a life form from scratch, which I see as a question Cindy has just, actually Cindy has landed a subtly different question. So I'm excited about constructing a life form from scratch where she's asking about creating a life form from scratch. Yeah, though it's slightly different what creation implies. Yeah, so, so as an engineer, um, I construct things, right? So, so I have an operational mastery of gravity. I don't understand gravity waves very well, um, but, I, but I, I understand like things fall down in a gravitational field. Um, I have a budget. Um, I have a limited ability to shape the universe, to shape matter. And so I can make a suspension bridge if I'm a structural engineer, right? And I work with the team. Um, and I'm, and I'm constructing that bridge, right? And there's, there's mysteries in how the bridge works fundamentally, but operationally, I can make a reliable suspension bridge. So with, with that sort of example, I'm comfortable uh, da, 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 responding, Cindy, to your question um, by, by being confident we can construct life from scratch, meaning I'm pretty sure we can put together a lifeless set of molecules and get a reproducing microbe um, out of that. Uh, and that feels like striking distance within the decade we can do that. I am absolutely certain that even if we can do that, it's still gonna be mysterious. There's still gonna be things about how life works that we don't understand. Um, so we can, we can talk more about it. I don't, I'm sorry if I'm being pedantic about the difference between construction and creation. I'm, I'm just trying to carefully qualify. I, I don't, have any expectation that we'll understand life at a fundamental level completely, um, maybe ever. But but as an engineer, I don't get hung up on that. I'm just I just want this operational understanding, um, if that makes sense. Sort of related to that. I mean, what do you think it means to make meaning when engineering biology? Um, what does it mean in relation to make meaning? Yeah. So um, a lot of times when people think about um, biotechnology, they think about life, um, the medicine that you can make or the disease you can cure or the environment you can fix or save or the materials you can make or the fuels you can generate, right? So, uh, and so on, right? So you think about what life can do, but you're asking about meaning. So I'll just give you a, a US example. Um, in the Declaration of Independence, there's a famous combination of words that starts with life but then carries on to liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And I'll use this example because it ties into some of the other stuff we've been talking about. So what would make a bioeconomy a uniquely American bioeconomy as opposed to say a Brazilian bioeconomy or a Czech bioeconomy or a Dutch bioeconomy? 
uh, or Chinese bioeconomy. And, and I would offer the, the American bioeconomy would advance not only life, all the things we think about, uh, medicine, fuel, shelter, stuff, but it would also advance liberty and the pursuit of happiness. We'd advance bioengineering and biotechnology to do these other things. There'd be, in other words, to use your word, Jordan, meaning being made because we have shared values that are stars in the sky animating and pulling us forward as a society. And so when we do things, even though they seem like they're esoteric technologies, we're vectoring them and ourselves towards our common telos, our shared goals. Um, so what does it mean to advance biotechnology in, in the name of liberty, right? Well, it comes back to ensuring that everybody has the option of accessing it if they need. What does pursuit of happiness means? Oh gosh, I mean, that's the magic part of that turn of phrase. Um, it's not for any one to decide for the other. Um, it just is a, a sort of permissive uh, uh, opening to allow a diversity of voices to resonate and ring. It's basically frame storming with moral values. Mm -hmm. um, that's awesome. Well, let's go to some of the Q and A questions. Um, from Alan Tong, we have. How do you go about developing an infectious disease forecast? Yeah, that's a great question, Alan. And um, yeah, I just got an email from Kent Redford earlier today, who works on wildlife conservation biodiversity, basically asking the same thing. And I, I, I was thinking about a, a conversation with George Church 15 years ago. We were talking about a weather map. Like, could you have a bio weather map? Um, and that seems like something you should be able to have. We don't really have it now. But when you think about the planet we're on Earth and how much DNA there is on the planet, within this century, we should be able to sequence it all, which means that on a recurring basis, we should just be able to be sequencing, you know, kind of like satellite observations of weather patterns. We should be able to have um, terrestrial observations of genetic patterns um, as they're promulgating. So, so if you don't have something like that, I guess what you're doing is you're sampling locally, which is kind of what we're doing now when we choose to pay attention. And we say, well, in this reservoir and these bats over here, there's this pathogen and maybe it'll leap to the human or not. And maybe we can do some experiments in labs or not, but it's very sparse sampling. you know. So we really have no idea what's out there right now. But I would say you'd wanna start by um, having an awareness of what the weather is, what the bio weather is. We'd want bio weather maps. Um, and it could just like it'd be crazy today to imagine having a international shipping network, you know, without knowing where there's going to be a typhoon. Um, it's just totally nuts. So, so we've got to get the bio weather map. There's another thing though, that we need, which is we need a much better physics model for how life works operationally. And, and this is related to some of the other questions that are showing up. There is, if, if I'll offer that the fundamental unit of life is not my idea, it's just my re re relating back to the obvious. Fundamental unit of life is a cell, right? The object that can take in molecules and, and energy and make a copy of itself. There's no cell on earth that we understand completely. No human cell that we understand completely, no microbial cell that we understand completely. The best studied simplest cells still have about 70 parts inside them, maybe 80. Each of these parts, total mystery what they do. Each of these parts individually, absolutely essential for life. Um, okay, so, so we have no real chance, I would say, of doing forecasting of anything if we're operating with objects where a quarter of the parts of the object are total mystery, even though all those parts are absolutely essential. It means we don't really have um, a, a physics framework or a modeling framework that allows us to do accurate interpolation or extrapolation, right? At best, we can do, you know, pattern matching. And, and storytelling. So, so there's a fundamental challenge that has to be addressed, which is we just have to understand life well enough to put it together. And I think if you combine that with the bio weather map, those two things would give me some confidence we could do meaningful forecasting. And um, I, I think we'll never fully be able to understand cells in a reductionist sense, um, because there isn't a one-to-one -one mapping for gene to phenotype and I guess most scenarios I mean there's a lot of like chaotic complexity that is going on um, but okay next question yeah I just I just like look 
taking things apart to see what's in there is a good way of learning. If you do that with your car, you'll learn something about a car and you'll, you'll take a step towards being a mechanic, but you'll also have a mess in your driveway. If you put those pieces back together and you get a functioning car, you've learned still more about cars and how they work and you'll definitely be a good mechanic, right? So biology, the science of taking life apart to understand the componentry works to a degree. We've got to complement that with synthesis to get the more operationally complete understanding. And that second complementary approach is really only upticked operationally, meaning practically in the last 20 years, um, you know, sporadically. So do you think it's possible um, for individual human brain organoids to gain consciousness? Yeah, I saw that question. That's a great question from William C. Yeah. Um, is it possible? Maybe. I'm very happy to promise possibilities, um, but I have no idea. Um, uh, I guess if it's uh, derived from starting material, which is derived from uh, a human brain, then I would expect that it's more likely to be possible. Um, you know, because you're, you're just basically making a derivative system that should should hopefully keep most of the fundamental stuff. But but of course, I instantly pause and represent, I know um, uh, how to represent consciousness, <laughs> right? Um, so, yeah, good question, well, don't know the answer. And wouldn't trust anybody's answer. Just but since you say, is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. It's a permissive yeah, word. Yeah, it's not not possible. I'm, I'm happy to promise possibilities. <laughs> It's just interesting because consciousness is probably a spectrum um, between different organisms with different sized brains. And uh, I mean, it might be an emergent property, I don't know. Um, what are some roles you see for a symbiote in the context of climate change? That's a, yeah, it's a very broad question, but they were talking about carbon capture um, versus social conception of nature thoughts on thoughts on climate change or maybe climate awesome well i mean look i mean um start with electricity fix carbon make stuff complement to photosynthesis in plants so so we can anticipate if we went for it fully refactoring the manufacturing supply chains for civilization um you know, weaning ourselves off of fossil inputs. That's, that's literally right in front of us. Um, uh, and you could even say underway. So, so I think from an emissions perspective, um, good to go. Um, you know, if you want to try and pull carbon down significantly, I don't think the numbers from the example I gave are that interesting, meaning I don't think formate biosynthesis is, is, makes a huge dent, but maybe I'm wrong on that. But I, but I think in terms of the footprint in the first place, you can make circular closed economies and um, mitigate um, as far as you want to push it emissions. Um, so it seems like there's a big deal there. I can't, I, can't I, I just want to say, I, it's like, I can't overstate how ripe mm -hmm. things are, right? Like that really seems like a good to go opening literally on a planetary civilization scale. So it's like, it's, it, what, let me give you the example of what I mean by that. In Europe, there's the space agency. In, in the US, there's NASA and SpaceX. There's no organizations like this anywhere for biology. There are not organizations that go on missions with professional staff that do heroic work for year upon year upon year for a decade. Um, but, but I would submit for consideration, we need to be thinking about bioengineering in this way, right? That Europe should have not only the European Space Agency with 15 going on 20 billion euros a year of funding for professional teams doing missions, but they should also have the European Life Agency um, building the cells and doing the other things and making infectious disease obsolete, right? And figuring out how to get distributed by manufacturing working and guaranteeing that the instantiation of those technologies is compatible with the um, European Parliament and the wishes of the society. Um, so, 
So that I think is, is just something that has to be stated plainly in terms of ripeness and also uh, ripeness in relation to scope of opportunity. Um, yeah. And how do you think about ethics in all of this? What kind of ethical code should be used with SynBio? Uh, the ethics of the society that you wish for. I think it's, a, I, 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 I've spent a lot of time on this at the internal microscopic scale. Um, uh, you know, like how do we govern DNA synthesis specifically and the technical implementation of that matters. I remember working with the FBI and others writing up reports on this. Um, but, but that actually turns out to be subsidiary to the big questions, which, which is what are the ethics of our society? And what do we wish to instantiate as a society? And then the answers to those questions turn into the reality of the technology, including the form of the technology. Um, so do we believe in free speech? Do we believe in freedom of the press? What do we believe in, right? Well, And who gets to answer those questions? We do. We do. We the people. We have, to, we, have to make, we have to make sure of that. We the people, right? So, hey, you know why Gettysburg was important in the United States? It's because of the speech. And in that speech, there's the turn of phrase, um, what is it? Government of the people, for the people, by the people shall not perish. Right? That's what that's what President Lincoln said, if I remember right. Um, so it's up to us. And it's it's what's very interesting to me is my entire life, I've got I've got a few years on most people here. My entire life I've inherited a system that worked well enough where you really didn't you learned about this stuff, but you didn't really have to operate it. You got to you kind of got to take it for granted. And and I'm feeling like we can't take it for granted anymore. Um, so it's up to us is the other way to say it. And, and it's, I would say it's up to us in a constructive way, which is a challenge, right? How do we bring forward these conversations and the best of our history and the best of our shared values, which have never been perfectly instantiated as yet and, and make things even better? Um, yeah, so, so I think in other words, if you get caught up in the microscopic ethics, those are valid. There's important things there, but it's, it's don't, don't, I feel like I've made a mistake and I don't wish for others to repeat the mistake, which is to be consumed by the microscopic ethics. Um, and, and, and the opportunity cost of being consumed with the microscopic ethics is you don't see the bigger, the bigger picture um, where the conversations are much more vital and, and much, much easier to include everybody in. If you choose to have a conversation about the ethics of whether or not you should build a synthetic cell, you have to have so much knowledge to get to the beginning of that conversation. Very, very few people can follow along that conversation. Um, but if you want to have a conversation about what are the values of our society and how does that shape what we should say is a good thing or a bad thing, well, many, many more people can have that conversation, I would submit. Um, so it has this secondary benefit of uh, being inclusive. Well, yeah, that's why we need people who aren't just engineers in the field of uh, SynBio. We need right. every every kind of person there is. That was one of the questions here um, of like, what are the roles of people who basically aren't engineers uh, in developing SynBio once we have like a registry of parts? Tell me what world you want. Tell other people what world you want. Tell me what your wishes are. Tell me what awesome is like, please. Um, like share that. Share a dream. Um, if you share a dream, then we can all understand what we're dreaming about and we can find the things in common that might animate us to work together in advance of making things true so that we make them true. Um, yeah. Some of you, many of you might be parents someday or maybe some of you are, I don't know. Um, but that's an interesting frame of reference to adopt because suddenly you have to think about those questions, if you wish, not just for yourself, but for your lineage, right? So I now have the privilege of thinking about, well, what do I want my kids to grow up with? Um, what are my wishes for their world? Um, and that's equally valid, I would say, and, and might be helpful for some in thinking about how to express what they wish for. Wow, well, I feel like that's a good note to end with. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, thank you so much for coming. That was awesome. I, I hope everyone really enjoyed that. We'll post this online afterwards. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, everybody, Sarah and Emily, for making this happen as well. And great to be here. And I hope you all have an awesome day.